And today, Liam, we've got a belter, we've got an MBE, we've got Gary Wolfenstorm. Arguably, arguably, uh, arguably, I don't know what, it's arguably, Wolstenholm. Wolf, let's go again. No, you can do my bit, you can cut my bit, can you not? No, but I think your bit was <coughs> brilliant. Shite. It was brilliant, right. but no, no, it was good. <coughs> okay. Wolsten. Wolsten home. Got it. Okay. Hi, guys. Welcome back to the 442 podcast. Uh, do us a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe. You'll really do us a big favor. Thank you. And today, Liam, we've got Gary Wolsten home, MBE, regarded as one of the best amateur players ever to play the game. He's got a career what spans a Masters. Oh, sorry. he got a career what spans two Masters appearances, two Opens, one US Open. He's won the British Amateur twice. And are you ready? Over 80 career victories as an amateur. Wow. And then he turned professional. He's won three on the Seniors Tour, one in Australia. This career is a long one, but he's also got a bit of claim to flame. A bit of claim... Oh, God. He's also got a bit of claim to play. You're on fire, Gary. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on fire here, aren't I? Oh, he's claimed to... F oh, sorry. Can we go again? Can we go again? No. Let's get it right. No, 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 right. I love the claim to flame. So, yeah. So, Gary's claim to... So, Gary's <laughs> often over... So, Gary's career is often overshadowed what he's achieved by one match, which gets talked about a lot, but his career is a lot more than this one match. Would you agree, Gary? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it'll be the thing that's on my tombstone, almost certainly, but um, there are other tournaments that I feel as though probably define my career far more, but it's the one that everyone remembers. So, bring us back to the start. We always good at golf. Where were you started playing? Um, I was four years old when I first started, and uh, my grandparents um, were very keen golfers. My grandfather had finished playing because of a, a bad hip, my grandma used to take me up to Grange Fell Golf Club and uh, I had some lessons with uh, the, the local pro called Fred Robinson and um, he dropped a sort of shag bag of balls in front of the first tee, little nine-hole golf course um, overlooking Cartmel. Um, and, um, you know, I had a pretty good natural swing straight away. Uh, I had three little clubs. I had a seven iron and a, a five wood and a putter. And uh, that's how I started, four years old. Do you remember your first handicap? Well, I was obviously a 24 handicapper when uh, um, I started, but I was a 23 handicapper when I was age 18. Uh, so I didn't... 18? Yeah. You was a 23 handicapper handicap at 18. 18. Yeah. So what clicked in your golf game? Well, something must have happened quickly. It was just the opportunity. I was caddying for my father, uh, who was a, a tour player, uh, Guy Wollstonehome. And um, I caddied for him for three years, 16, 17, 18 years old. But uh, it, it really didn't materialise until, um, you know, I joined Silverdale Golf Club, which is uh, up in Cumbria. And um, a little nine-hole golf course again. And my mum got me into the club and used to take me over to the, uh, the course and leave me there for sort of a few hours so I could go and play golf. Um, and I loved it. That was my first sort of, if you like, proper club. I was probably the world's greatest 23 handicapper at that, I that think stage. You were. Um, and, um, you know, I got down to, I think, about eight handicap um, very quickly, as in a half my handicap every year. And I moved down to Leicester to uh, get a job. And my father had been brought up in Leicester and he'd been a member at Kirby Muxlow Golf Club. And uh, so he wanted me to join Kirby Muxlow. And he, by that stage, had realised that I was going to play, but he didn't want me to turn professional. He said, you know, it's basically, it's a hard living uh, and only very few make it. Um, so I sort of, I think I probably adhered to that. Um, yeah, pretty much was one of the reasons why I stayed amateur for so long, but there was lots of other reasons as well. But when I moved down to Leicester, I then started playing county golf. My first handicap given to me at Kirby Muxler was a five handicap. Um, and then I did quite well in the club championship, the first sort of big comp that I played down there. And uh, they dropped me to um, two handicap pretty much straight away, which I felt was a little bit unfair, but it sort of drove me on. And then I got an opportunity to play for Leicestershire in their second team and uh, proved you know, pretty successful. 
um, good experience and an opportunity which uh, didn't did allow me to then develop uh, much quicker than I would have done during the summer months. Obviously, played you know virtually every hour that I could get um, uh, down to uh, Kirby Muxlow, but. I realised it was too far. It was two bus journeys and 45 minutes. Um, and I joined the Leicestershire Golf Club, which was literally from the digs that I was living in, um, probably about half an hour walk, which is what I did. I had no money in those days, no car. And um, I used to walk up to the golf club with my clubs on my back and, and you know, I would literally be hitting 800 balls and a, and a round of golf. Um, and I just loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. And the fact that I started to be more successful, but I was pretty much self-taught. So my swing wasn't the greatest and I wasn't a very long hitter, but I had a re really, really good short game. And uh, that's what sort of allowed me to be start to be successful. By then, I was starting to get my handicap down. I was, um, I think I was a scratch handicap at 24 and uh, played for England for the first time when I was 27. So I, my my progression was very quick, um, and uh, you know that said, it was the thing that gave me an opportunity to define me as an individual. I had nothing else. I wasn't really good at anything else, um, and so I focused entirely on my golf, and and it gave me an identity and uh, an opportunity to be able to shine, you know, when you know I had nothing else. So I'm going to fast forward you. 1992, Ganton, yep. British amateur. Yeah. What a win. It was for lots of different reasons because I'd actually played really well uh, and the Walker Cup was that particular year at um, uh, Port Marnock and uh, the British team got, well, slaughtered basically. Uh, Phil Mickelson was in that team. Uh, they had a guy called Bob May who was uh, another very, very good player. And... Um, the Americans, that's the last time that virtually the full American team came over to play in the Walker Cup uh, and then went on to play the amateur championship the following week. And Phil Mickelson was the only man out of their 10-man team um, that didn't play. Uh, he went back to the States. But the rest, they had their full American team um, playing in the, Walker, uh, in the, sorry, in the amateur championship at Ganton. And um, I'd been playing great that year. Um, to the extent where some people had said that maybe I should have played in the Walker Cup. Um, but anyway, um, Ganton suits me absolutely down to the ground. It's a, a gorse lined, um, you know, with heather and trees and everything else. It's a wonderful, wonderful golf course. It can get windy though as well, can it? Well, it can, but um, that summer was, was really uh, a hot summer and the fairways were almost white. And the ball was running, but you had to hit it straight. And that was obviously my, my great strength and the fact that I had a good short game as well. And I was progressing, progressing, progressing. Um, and I played a guy called Wilson Bryson in the semi-final, a Scots guy. Played really well uh, to beat him, I think, three and two. And then uh, that got me to the final. And I was playing Bob May, who was basically regarded as one of the best players that America produced for some time. But I think, um, you know, the fact that uh, I didn't get off to the greatest of starts um, might have helped me because um, I trailed behind a couple of uh, um, RNA members that were walking with the match. And I can remember I lost, I think, the fifth hole and I was one down and uh, one turned to the other and said, oh, well, that's that then, you know, basically expecting me to lose. And I thought to myself, I haven't lost yet. Uh, and I was a good match player. Um, you know, I've, I've got sort of various uh, reputation um, for sort of being able to grind matches out. And I was playing well. I knew I was playing well. But uh, between the ninth hole in the morning and the ninth hole in the afternoon, I was around 66, including a double bogey. Um, and um, because of that, uh, it got me from being, you know, you know, basically one down at that stage um, to uh, being, I think, six up or something like that. And I finished up winning eight and six. So that victory got you into the Open at Mirrorfield. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about that week. Um, Do you remember your pairings? Paired with Gary Player and Tom Weisskopf. Wow. 
Gary Player was <coughs> didn't stop talking almost the whole way round and was great to play with, real entertainment. Um, and Tom Weisskopf wasn't really in the greatest of, of moods, uh, didn't really say anything to me at all. Um, but it was a fantastic experience. The weather wasn't great and the golf course was probably... That week it was hard um, and I struggled. I think I shot a couple of 77s or something like that to miss the cut. But a fantastic experience. I mean, any time that you're in front of TV, crowd, uh, TV cameras and crowds, um, I revel in it. I have to be entirely honest. I love being the showman. Um, and so I was a bit disappointed not to do better. Um, but that experience then carried me again that little bit further from the point of view that those sorts of experiences define you as an individual. You either love that sort of situation or you hate it. Um, and I found that I actually really enjoyed being front of crowds and not everyone does because um, you're in a microcosm there. You're right there in front of, you know, obviously literally tens of thousands of people. Did you ever look looking back, Gary? I mean, obviously playing with top top players. Mm. Were you the type of player that went into these events, even though, like you said, you didn't make the cut in the open, but playing alongside Gary Player, etc. What did you take away from that? As in, did you take any tips from them that did you good, or did you learn things from them that did you? Good? I, I was I was lucky. <clears throat> I, I played with a lot of exceptional players. I mean, um, I can remember um, in '92. Uh, having the opportunity to play uh, a practice round prior to the Scottish Open up at uh, um, Glen Eagles. I had a practice round with Seve. I was on the putting green and I was just practicing my putting. And you always get a sense of somebody near you, particularly if they have that sort of charisma. And I looked up and uh, it was Seve. And he said, uh, is it all right if I have a practice round with you? <laughs> so I took one second to think about it and I thought, yeah, I'd really quite enjoy that. And um, we played uh, Peter Mitchell and Mark Farry, the Frenchman, uh, and uh, Seve and myself went out for a practice round. And Peter Mitchell's uh, a wonderful coach. He's become a really good coach. But he had a wonderful attitude. He was, all right, Sev, you like this. And, and Seve was starting to struggle at that stage with his game. And I can remember um, he wasn't hitting it brilliantly well on the first couple of holes. And all of a sudden, Peter Mitchell just clicked with Seve and to the extent he played the next sort of 12 holes in six under par and could have been eight under par and uh, it was just fantastic to watch he was probably one of my great heroes of the game uh, playing it absolutely his supremely best uh, to the extent where his attitude and, and his demeanor and everything uh, got uh, he was relaxed he was enjoying it laughing Peter's a very funny guy anyway, Peter Mitchell. Uh, and I had a personal bunker lesson with Seve on the 16th hole, um, which, you know, was just defining in a lot of ways. My bunker play improved a lot from that moment because Seve showed me an awful lot of, of how to play the various shots. Uh, it was unbelievable to see somebody that up close have such a mastery of short game. So 92, after you win, you played in the Open. Mm. That got you an invite for 93 to the Masters. Uh, no, I, I won in 91. I played the Masters in 92, and then I played the Open in 92 as well. Go on, John, so, say uh, it. Yeah. Say it, John, go on. Stato, <laughs> go on. Stato, my backside. Oh, doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Consistency, John. But, no, but, but, but going through the gates, going through the gates, what was that like after seeing it and watching it? Uh Washington Road, which goes outside the front gates. Um, so you're going down the, down this sort of highway and then you've got this wonderful uh, sort of laurel hedge, uh, which goes down the outside of the property, uh, which is, must be about eight feet high. Um, and you sort of see the entrance and there's a guard, white guard hut uh, uh, there with a barrier and everything. And I turned into the, um, the, the, the sort of the entryway and uh, this guard with a big gun and everything, he was there and he was uh, just sort of, you know, sorry, your name is? And my name's Gary Wilson. I'm, I'm arriving to have a practice. This was on the Saturday before. And uh, so he checked down the list. Oh, yes, Mr. Wilson, um, yes, if you just go down uh, Magnolia uh, Drive here, um, you know, you'll see the clubhouse. And if you just go off to the right, there's the car park. 
great. So I was always determined to go down uh, Magnolia Way with um, you know as slow as possible. Uh, and I must have gone at about two miles an hour. The, the guard must have been thinking, what is he doing? But I suppose he must be used to it because um, you've got this sort of tunnel of um, shrubs that you sort of go down. You can see something sort of bright white at the far end, which is the clubhouse. But um, I sort of drove down there, which on the right-hand side was the practice ground, as was, um, which is this immaculate green flat beautiful um you know tended uh, piece of grass and then you come down and you come out into this and there's a roundabout which must be one of the few roundabouts in the united states at that stage and uh, then you've got this wonderful clubhouse bright white it's not hugely imposing but it's just the fact that you've seen it a thousand times on tv uh and um you know i parked the car up and then i went in and uh, registered, uh, and I think I registered uh, number two. Uh, so I, they always keep number one for the winner uh, of the previous year. Um, no, well, that's small, I didn't know. So you get your badge, which um, you know is is synonymous with uh, the clubhouse, and you sort of keep it on your lapel, and that's basically your access uh, into everything. Um, but I registered number two that year because uh, I got Kingman. there so early. Keen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was very keen. <laughs> Do you stay there by winning the British Amateur? You have the option as an amateur to stay in the Crow's Nest, which is this um, uh, sort of famous room at the top of uh, uh, the, the clubhouse. But my view was um, not to do that. And the reason being is that um, I've been told that basically it's, it's a, a large room, which is basically a dormitory, uh, has six beds in it, with a six foot partition between each bed. And uh, there's no air conditioning, or there wasn't in those days. And uh, there's no curtains around the, the windows of the top section. So I thought to myself, well, ap apart from anything else, I always traveled heavy. So it was getting all my gear up this very steep um, staircase into this room. And I just didn't fancy it. But getting back to not staying in the dormy house, it did you well because uh... Day one, you're playing with Arnold Palmer. Yeah. With 14 holes in, you're leading the tournament. Yeah, and it, 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 there's a, a lot of stories. I do a, a whole speech on, on that first day because a lot happened. Um, my boss, um, I've got 10.30 tea time, so I get there really early. I was there at 8 o'clock, uh, had a bit of breakfast, and then um, I'd had a parcel come through from, I think it was gear for golf or something like that, make metal woods. And of course, metal woods in those days are all very new, so very small heads. Anyway, um, this box had arrived, Mr. Wilson. Home Please issue. tell me you didn't get home, mate. So anyway, um, I said to my caddy, right, bring them down. We'll, we'll have a swish with them and see how they feel. So anyway, I'm practicing away. And I said, give me those woods. Let's, let's give them a go. Anyway, I've got this little baby draw with this uh, driver. So I'm thinking, these are, these are actually going right. So I said, uh, right, we're putting these in the bag. Literally, I've hit five or six shots with each one. That's it. They've just arrived. And David, my caddy, said, you must be mad. What are you doing? You can't put those in the bag. So anyway, I've said, look, I'm having them in the bag. I'm getting this little baby drawer. They're perfect. So anyway, I, shaking his head like this. And uh, so I've gone on to the putting green and... I'm, I'm absolutely mustard at putting, and I've got these greens absolutely down. So I decide to go on to the tee before, you know, well before my tee time. So I've watched the group in front, and the atmosphere is unbelievable. It's electric. It always is on the first day, and there's literally thousands of people there. Anyway, I get onto the tee, and uh, I go up to the starter. I said, is it all right if I just stand at the back of the tee just to get the atmosphere uh, of the event and you know, hopefully calm me down. And Peter Alice, uh, my godfather, had said, this is the best thing. Just, you know, relax, try and keep everything calm, you know, lower your heart rate, swing as slowly as possible. You know, that will serve you well on the first tee. So I was trying, to get, this was going through my mind. If somebody had said to me, I'll give you a million quid to tell me who was on that tee before us, I couldn't have told you. 
because it, I'm just taking it all in. The atmosphere is just amazing. So then the great thing about Augusta National is wherever you go, if there's somebody quite famous, like a Jack Nicholas or whatever, there's a hubbub that slowly builds up where people go, oh, it's Jack Nicholas or whatever. Um, John Daly was the big name in those days because he'd won at Crooked Stick the week before. So any time John Daly was coming anywhere, everyone's nudging each other and it builds up, builds up, crescendo. And all of a sudden, Arnold Palmer comes on to the, bursts through the crowd. Arnold Palmer comes, crowd go berserk, arm up like this. Anyway, he walks up to the starter and, and uh, the starter says to Arnold Palmer, he said, uh, Arnie, I have waited all my life to be able to meet you and do this job on the first tee. And Arnie turns to him and he says, well, I'm glad we both made it then. <laughs> Which, because the guy was quite old. Um, so anyway, he then, the, the starter says to Arnold Palmer, Mr. Palmer, this is your playing partner for today, um, Mr. Wollstonehome. Um, so Arnie comes over and he shakes my hand. And I've got this amazing picture of me shaking Arnold Palmer's hand on the first tee. And Arnold said, I knew you, Father. He was a really good guy. I've really uh, enjoyed his company in the past. Uh, I'm really looking forward to today. And goes over to his bag. Well, of course, I feel 100 feet high. Here's Arnold Palmer, one of the greatest players of all time. Comes up and saying he's looking forward to playing golf with me. So uh, anyway, um, I stood at the back of the tee. All of a sudden, it's four on the tee, Mr. Palmer. Play away, please. And off it goes hits this amazing drive down the first hole. Now he's got a steel-shafted, persimmon-headed driver, not the big thing that everyone's these days, in those days rather, hitting metal woods. And he's, hit, he's crunched this tee shot. 63, 293 yards straight down the middle. Crowd go berserk. They're applauding, whooping and hollering, and palms waving to the crowd. And I'm stood at the back of the tee. And I'm having a, I've got this fantastic view of what's going on. So anyway, all of a sudden I've realised it's my turn to play. So I walk across to my caddy. My caddy hands me the driver. He said, for God's sake, don't miss it. <laughs> well, I hadn't even contemplated missing it until he'd mentioned it. So anyway, I get the driver. Brand new driver. I've only hit five times on the practice ground. Anyway, I have absolutely killed it. All this, try and slow it down. Forget that. I mean, it's gone in a blur. I suppose it must have been a little bit slow. But anyway, I've crunched this drive and I've hit it 260 yards straight down the middle. Now, I'm not a long hitter. So let me tell you, that was a world-class drive for me. Well, I'm so pumped up with adrenaline that I'm literally running off the tee. I'm, I'm like, oof. Anyway, I've realised that my playing partner, my, the two caddies are like 30 yards behind me. So I've had to stop and, and sort of walk back. So I'm terribly sorry, but I was really excited about this. So anyway, um, we get down to the, the, the sort of tee shots. Now I've got a seven iron in. I can remember it vividly. I hit a really good seven iron, but it comes up a bit short, 20-odd feet. But I'm putting uphill, so great. I'm in a good position. Mr. Palmer hits his nine iron onto the, uh, the green, probably about 12 foot away. Good chance for birdie. Crowd going berserk. Anyway, I've been on that putting green in front of the clubhouse for at three quarters of an hour. I've got the pace, I'm putting well. You know, I, I'm a great putter. So I'm thinking, right, it's uphill, left to right, hit the putt, and I think, oh, okay, it's just gonna miss left. Be a tap in for a four. Oh no, it goes six and a half feet past. I'm looking at it thinking, how is this possible? I've got the pace, I have, I'm world-class putter, got the pace, I've gone six and a half feet past. I get told afterwards that they triple freaky the first green. And what that means is it's really quick. So they've done it deliberately to try and put people off because it's part of the defense of the course is the greens. Now, if you lose your pace, you know, it's a way of stopping people shooting really low scores. So anyway, Mr. Palmer's got um, a 12 footer, knocks it four foot past. I miss my little downhill left to righter from six and a half feet, which, you know, was a fairly easy putt to miss. But then Mr. Palmer misses his. So we're both stalking off to the second tee. And I, we're stood there. And it's a tableau. I'm looking up in the sky. My caddy's looking down here. Mr. Palmer's looking over there. And you can almost put a bubble of thoughts. Oh, I'm going to shoot 100. Please, for God, you know, please, anything less than 100 will be good. My caddy's thinking... 
I should be at work. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, you know, he's going to really embarrass us both. And Mr. Palmer's thinking, well, yeah, why do they always pair me with the amateur? Anyway, fortunately, as I say, we had a bit of time to um, relax. And that gave me the opportunity just to sort of calm down a bit. But I did the second, but I did the third. So I'm, you know, under par. And then all of a sudden I parred, you know, four and five, um, which are really hard holes, by the way. Six make a, 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 a nice opportunity for birdie, but just miss it. Seven birdie, eight birdie. All of a sudden I'm, I'm three under par. Come down the last, uh, down number nine rather. Now I've, I've played a really good shot over the trees, really hard hole for me. I put it through the back edge of the green, I chip it down, and, and it's like a marble staircase. And I've got it to three and a half feet. And Mr. Palmer's gone, that was a fantastic chip, Gary. Well played. So I'm thinking, oh, this is pretty good. Anyway, he makes his par. And uh, I'm thinking, for God's sake, please don't miss it, don't miss it. Anyway, it goes in, fortunately. And some wag in the crowd, because you have to walk you know, through the crowd to get to the 10th tee, it says, don't look at the leaderboard. And uh, so, of course, the first thing you do is you look up. I'm leading the Masters. When you were leading and you looked up at the scoreboard, were you conscious of the fact that now the spotlight's on me? Because I think it's a natural thing where whoever's leading at that point, and I think you would have probably, because you're an amateur as well, you would have got more attention. Were you conscious of the fact that right, I'll be on the television now and I'll, they'll be concentrating on me? I think that you notice that the cameras are starting to focus on, on your game. But by that stage, I'd forgotten all about the crowds and the cameras completely. I was just intent on, you know, perhaps shooting a, a, a subpar score. And, yeah, the 10th hole, I'm not quite long enough to get it long way down the hill. So I had a, a three iron into the green, which unfortunately, because I was on a downslope and I hadn't thought about this, I just leaked it right into the bunker. Uh, and I played a great bunker shot out to about six feet and lipped out. And I thought I'd hold it. I actually was almost punching the air, which is a big cardinal mistake, uh, until, the holes, until the putts dropped in the hole. Um, and I made a couple of silly mistakes, but the, it's a hard golf course for somebody who doesn't hit it a long way. But it, it, in, in 92, the course was only 7,000 just over. When I played the second time, 12 years later, which is, again, quite an interesting uh, split from the first time we played to the, the, you know, the last time, it had lengthened by over 400 yards. So it's seven, just over 7,400 uh, 7, yards. Um, it, it's a hard golf course because the, the demand is getting it into the right place on the greens. So unless you're a long hitter, um, you know, you're you at a huge disadvantage. Can I take you back? As an amateur, going to Augusta, mm -hmm. going out to the Masters, how would you travel? How would you, how would you fund it? How would you, I mean, it's like, because you I mean, you see people go out private jets, everything yeah. else and everything. How would you as an amateur then fund it? Did you take a caddy out with you? Did you get one out there? Did you, what was your preparation like? Uh, well, it was about as good as I could, because as soon as I got the invite through the post, which is uh, you, in December, you get this letter through the post. You're cordially invited to play in the, you know, Masters um, 1992, uh, and then you get a load more sort of letters and stuff through, which is fantastic. Uh, I then had uh, a guy um, who was a member at Bristol and Clifton Golf Club uh, who um, you know, was involved with travel, golf travel and that sort of thing. He got me a business class flight on Delta Airways into Atlanta. He then got me uh, golf on a couple of different courses. And uh, funnily enough, I played at the, Atla um, the Golf Club of Georgia, which um, you know, it was a brand new course in those days. The clubhouse hadn't even been built. Uh, and again, a fantastic experience to be able to play the two courses there. Uh, got the lake and, and uh, the creek. Um, and in fact, funnily enough, 12 years later, I played an international match, US amateur champion against the British amateur champion, which was covered on TV the week before the Masters, which is a, um, you know, now a regular occurrence. They do it every year. And uh, so it was funny that I'd gone to play at the Golf Club of Georgia that first time, 12 years beforehand, um, at that course. Um, 
So I then traveled down uh, to Augusta and I got uh, another uh, friend of mine who knew somebody who lived in Martinez. So I then got free accommodation there. Um, so it, it, you, I did it on a shoestring budget, basically. Because uh, I had no money in those days. No. I mean, I was, uh, I was working as uh, um, yeah, basically a marketing manager for a, a solicitor's practice, which, uh, yes, I had a car. Uh, I think I had a, um, I think it was a, a Vauxhall Astra or something like that. What about a caddy? Did you? Caddy was my boss. Okay. And he actually said, I'll let you play, because obviously I had to get time off work, uh, if you let me caddy for you. Now, he was a good player. He was a scratch plus handicap playing for Gloucestershire. Uh, and he was the reason I had the job in the first place. So I, there was no way I could say no. <laughs> but uh, we did have some fun um, with it because he got the overalls on and everything else. But uh, we got some great pictures, um, you know, with him. We had, I had a, lucky enough to have a practice round with Jack Nicholas, uh, which was, uh, to me, he is my ultimate player. Uh, he had everything. I, I'm actually lucky enough to play with uh, Nicholas a few times. Um, and we got on really well. Uh, I went to uh, Muirfield Village to play the memorial, um, and I actually had lunch with him in the middle of the round. He and Tom Weiskopf and myself went out and had a practice round. And uh, again, one of those magical days that you have in your life where you get the opportunity to talk to somebody on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, and you learn so much about people um, and, you know, his business um, acumen and how um, Muirfield Village even started in the first place. It was because members at the club let him um, build the place and, and uh, helped him fund it uh, to the extent where it's, it's almost Augusta with rough. It's that good. Um, it, again, one of the great clubs in the world, in my opinion. Right, I'm going to fast forward, you know. A young 35-year-old, Gary, turning up, Walker Cup, Royal Path Crawl, singles match against a certain Tiger Woods. Yeah. It was funny because um, that week, um, it was my first Walker Cup. Uh, a lot of pressure, obviously. I've been playing for England since 88, so um, I built up a good reputation as a, a match player, but... Um, because I wasn't a long hitter, uh, it took a long time for the selectors to trust me uh, to be able to, um, you know, represent Great Britain and Ireland. Um, but I'd done a lot that year. And in fact, they picked eight of the ten, um, you know, early. And uh, they then waited a couple of weeks just to see who else was in form before picking the last two players. And I was lucky enough that I won the inaugural British mid-amateur um, at Sunningdale on the new course. And I was told after I'd won that that I was going to be selected by Clive Brown. So fantastic, uh, it, uh, you know, to get that news. It was an added bonus for winning the championship. Uh, and I played great all week. Um, so I suppose in some respects I'd cemented my place because of that. Uh, I think I probably would have been selected anyway, but it was nice to be able to do that uh, good confidence booster. We had a great summer and we arrived at, at, at Porth Call and the weather had just turned. And sadly, the greens uh, got diseased. So they were quite bumpy, but they were quick. Um, so short game became really key. You had to be really good. And I can remember we had our practice and everything else, and there was a rumour that Tiger had got food poisoning, but I think, to be honest, he just didn't really want to be there. But he was ticking boxes. Uh, you know, he'd broken a lot of Nicholas's records. You know, he'd won uh, three US Junior Championships in a row. He then won two US Amateurs in a row. And he actually finished up winning th another, th another one uh, the following year before turning professional. Um, and he'd just been part of the US wa wa um, Eisenhower Trophy team, which is uh, the World Team Championships, uh, which is a four-man team and uh, in those days. And uh, he'd been part of that winning team. He'd broken all the Pac-10 records uh, from the collegiate system. He, he was, you know, obviously the world's best amateur at that stage. 
and I can remember um, the opening ceremony on the Friday night. I had all the Welsh people there, and they were singing songs, and the brass band was there, and the atmosphere was amazing. And what they always do is they um, announce the pairings for the Saturday. And I'd been told by Cloud Brown that he wasn't going to pick me in the foursomes, which I was gutted about because it gives you a feel for, you know, the course and how it's playing. So I was really disappointed not to play in that opening foursomes. And I was told I was playing number, um, basically number eight. Um, and, uh, uh, sorry, yes, I was playing, yes, the eight, because it's uh, there's only eight, eight matches and you, you've got two guys that sit out both morning and afternoon. So I was playing number eight, uh, anchor role, which I've been doing for England, um, although they sometimes played me top. And uh, so anyway, after Tiger hadn't been announced in the first three, I stood next to Gordon Cherry, who's this six foot eight, um, shock of you know, red hair, real character. And he turns to me and I've got this great photograph of him shaking hands. And, you know, the reason he was shaking my hand was he said, you've got him. Now, everyone wanted Woods because it was a no-lose situation. If you lost the match, well, he'd play in the world's best amateur. But if you win, you're the hero. So, of course, um, he shook my hand anyway. Uh, the announcement to Michael Benalek, who was uh, secretary of the RNA in those days, uh, said, and uh, in the final game, uh, Tiger Woods, uh, representing the United States and uh, representing Great Britain and Ireland, Gary Wollstoneholm. And the crowd went, ooh, like this. Well, I looked over at Woods, and he's sort of looking around, thinking, what's the big deal? But my reputation at that stage had been somebody that hard to beat in match play. So, of course, they, they, they were looking forward to this match because it was definitely David and Goliath. There's no doubt about that. Woods could reach, he could drive three par fours. He could hit every par five with no more than a five iron, which is what actually happened. Uh, the opening hole... It's a bit different now to, to um, you know, the, the course as it is now at Porthcawl. It's been sort of slightly redesigned, rejigged. And the first hole, he could hit with a one iron off the tee, par four. And I'm hitting like a, a three wood and a, and a nine iron. Um, so anyway, we finished up. I think we halved the first one with the three. And then uh, second hole, um, he's hit it 85 yards past me. So he's only hitting an eight iron into the green. And I fit a five wood just short of the green. Not a bad shot, really. It left myself a decent up and down opportunity. He hits this eight iron over the back of the green. And if you know Porth Call at all, it's got out of bounds right behind the green. So he's gone out of bounds. So I go one up. And then, you know, I managed to go two up on another hole and then get to the par five, which is about the sixth hole. And um, he's outdriven me by 100 yards. So he's hitting eight iron again into this par five. I'm hitting a five wood and I managed to get it onto the front edge, so not a bad shot. And we're walking up and I always had this idea that you need to walk in front of your opponent. So he's always looking at your back. It's a psychological thing. And uh, so I've walked up and I'm halfway between woods and the green with my caddy. So anyway, he's hit this eight iron and uh, I'm looking at it. I'm thinking that looks a bit long to me. And there's a guy sat on the wall by the green. Bald-headed guy. I can, I'll never forget, he's, he's sat there, and he's almost like he's the tallest person behind the green. Anyway, it's hit him slap bang on the top of the head. He peels over the back of the wall. I thought he killed. I thought Woods had killed him. Pitched it straight on the top of his head, peels over the back of the wall. He's out of bounds. So now he has to play another shot from there. So I win that hole as well. So I'm now three up. And we, we look over the wall to see if there's any blood or whether there's a guy dead or... He's gone. He's disappeared. I don't know what happened to that man. But anyway, he certainly helped me because it obviously hit him on the head and he went out of bounds. Um, but then Woods could drive the next hole, uh, which is a par four, which he put into the greenside bunker. Um, the the next hole is a par three and he's pitched it right over the back of the green and it's screwed back onto the green. I mean, the guy was phenomenal. He just, he could play shots. 
that I hadn't seen before from anybody. Um, so the, 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 the match then ebbed and flowed. He got a couple back. He won the par five and then he won another hole. And we got to 14. And this is, this is where I think the match turned mentally as well as anything else. Back to all square, uh, stood on the 14. I put it on the green. Woods has put it over the back. And he's dead. Absolutely dead. Um, and he chips back onto the green to about 25 feet. And I'm at I'm 15 feet. I've hit a great shot in. He holds it for a three. Tiger Woods, the whole thing, the crowd are going berserk. Like this, and he's going, oh, like this. And, the, you know, sort of giving me the look in the eye. You know, you, you've, you've, I've got you. So anyway, um, fortunately, I take my time. I hold my putt for a two. So I go one up. And a biographer that followed Woods throughout his career, certainly as an amateur anyway, he came to me after the match and he said, that's the first time I've ever seen an element of doubt while Woods is playing match play that he thought he might lose that match because he won three US junior championships in a row he then wins three US amateurs in a row he doesn't lose at match play he, he was like five down with seven to play and wins the US amateur the, the fact is he just never believed he could ever lose and the remaining holes there was again it ebbed and flowed to the extent where coming down the last he's hit one iron down the left and he's just in the semi I've hit a driver uh, down uh, the right side of the fairway and I've hit a five wood into the green. The only place you can't miss is right. And I've just peeled off the right edge of the green, but I'm fine. So now Woods has got a seven iron into the green and we have everybody watching. There must be eight and a half thousand people lining the fairway and round by the green, which is a, a fantastic uh, view because the sun had come out having not had a great and you've got this wonderful beam of light coming across um you know the the the, the bit of ocean there and uh, i'll i'll n vividly remember there's thousands of people there watching tv cameras and everything else and woods slightly uncertain turns to his caddy for the first time and says to him what do you think it is eight or a seven iron and <laughs> i'll never forget mark banker his name was he turns to, he says, well, what, what do you feel most comfortable with? Because he hadn't a clue, because he'd never been asked, never thought about the fact that he was going to get asked. Um, so he's going, well, oh, I think I'm going to stick with a little seven iron. So it, anyway, it, it just peels left. And again, I'm halfway between the green and woods. And my caddy's gone, it's going out of bounds, it's going out of bounds. Anyway, it's pitched into the crowd. We've got no idea, and it's been signalled that it's out of bounds. And there is a tiny rut about six inches wide that signals or, or stipulates the out of bounds on the left of the green. Anyway, it's gone out of bounds. Now, all credit to a 19-year-old. He's kept his ground. He's waited until it's signalled. And I've turned to my caddy and said, look, we haven't, we haven't won this hole because we're all square playing the last. Uh, now, it's crucial. At this stage, we've got a one-point lead. If I lose the match, we're all square. If we halve the match, then we've still got a one-point advantage going into the second day. Or if I win the match, then we've got a two-point advantage going into the second day. Obviously, a massive thing, because they started to call the Walker Cup the Walkover Cup, because America kept winning. I think we'd only won twice in about... 30 appearances or whatever. Um, and, you know, the fact that, you know, we needed to win to give us credibility because the Europeans were saying we should be Europe against, like the, like the Ryder Cup, should be Europe against uh, the United States. So anyway, gets handed another ball, hits the shot 15 feet. I've got to, I then chip up to two and a half feet, which was a pretty good chip from where I was. And, of course, Woods misses, so he concedes the hole. So all of a sudden, we've now got a two-point advantage going into the second day. And, of course, team bus going back to the hotel. Um, fantastic atmosphere. I mean, we've got people like um, David Howell and Podrick Harrington playing in our, you know, Stephen Gallagher. You know, we had a great team. And, you know, the, the fact that we had so much fun 
on that journey back. It took a lot of pressure off. Do you think that uh, on, on the green, when obviously he's putted, yeah. and you've come back, responded with a two, yeah. normally you would have crumbled. Not you personally, but whoever's playing Tiger would have crumbled because of the intimidation factor. And he wouldn't have been used to that, would he? No, and I play my own game. So I, all my career, <clears throat> I've always just played my own game. I mean, it doesn't matter whether somebody's hitting it 50, 60, 100 yards past me. I just played my own game. Unfortunately, because my game was very accurate, I would often put my longer club on the green somewhere near to the flag, and it puts pressure on your, your opponent. I mean, um, I, I ran into a, a, an old official from the French Federation a few years ago. He said, uh, great to see you again. He said, uh, do you know what your nickname was in the French team? He said, uh, it was nightmare. Because they would almost without fail outdrive me by 40, 50, 60, 80 yards. But um, I would always get the result. I mean, I hit some um, ex phenomenal shots uh, in, in matches that even I look back now and I think, how the hell did I do that? But I had this ability to be able to pull out a shot that, they would just go, they were expecting to win the hole and all of a sudden they were then having to fight to halve the hole. Uh, and it's just something that's, that's I've been lucky enough to have happen. And invariably you playing first would mean if you did pull out that yeah. good shot, yeah. even more pressure on them. Well, that's exactly and, right. Yeah. And that's what tended to happen. Almost to the extent where they were shocked into... Uh, a mistake because they weren't expecting me to be able to to do that and that's that was characteristic of of my match play for years and years and years um it's not that you're infallible you're not you are obviously uh, golf is not um but i worked hard i i, I was uh, an obsessive compulsive so um I, I was focused on my own game and what i do and i knew my game well enough that um, i could take on shots sometimes that perhaps I shouldn't have done. I mean, golf is really a, a mental strength game. And you would, the way you played, yeah. you would really need to be strong mentally because, like you said, not to be intimidated by somebody knocking at 80, 100 yards past you. And I was a showman. I loved showing off. So I would take on shots that, um, you know, I'd practised a lot, like the lob shot and stuff like this, or out of bunkers. Yeah, perhaps with even a fairway would. I mean, I, I, I would be prepared to take on shots um, and not think of the consequences, just the outcome. You know, I, uh, I've always said to people that, that golf and success in golf is a, is a fine line between, you know, success and failure. And it's losing the fear of failure, but having the desire and the will to want to win. And I felt as though I, I addressed that and accepted it and used it to my advantage. Whereas I think a lot of people who were way more talented than me that uh, were in England squads and things like that, um, maybe because I wasn't as good as they were, maybe that's what drove me to accept that sometimes you do hit bad shots, but you know it's how you then recover from them. And I was good at recovering. It was as simple as that, really. There were no need for recovery today in our match, were there, John? No. <laughs> you smug sod. Uh, well, I tell it to God, listen, I'm going to fast forward, you know. 48-year-old decided to turn pro. That's after another Masters uh, appearance, another Open, <sighs> US Open. But 48-year-old, why? Did you have visions of the seniors tour? Uh, well, basically, uh, it was along the lines of um, that England had just told me that they weren't going to select me anymore. They were going For to concentrate. Well, they were going to age. concentrate on the yeah, it was age really. They were going to concentrate on the under twenty fives. I was forty eight at that stage. Um, they felt that uh, they'd seen the best of me, um, even though I won my last amateur tournament uh, with four rounds in the sixties, which is the Lee Westwood Trophy at Rotherham. Um, you know, I was I was still good enough, and in fact, funnily enough, uh, England lost the home internationals that year quite badly. And one of the reports said uh, lacked experience. So I sort of not laughed to myself, but you know, I just thought, well, 
there lies the story. Why wouldn't you want to use somebody that was still playing well enough? John, as a sportsman like footballer, Gary there, yeah. young lads coming through, yourself coming through, you know, we've, we've talked about people mm -hmm. taking under the wing. Yes. He would have been good though, wouldn't he? Absolutely. would have been a good help from one. I mean, as a soundboard for the younger players, as a somebody with the knowledge and experience that you've obviously had, I it's not that they even need to speak to you. It's the fact of the way you carry yourself, that your demeanour, um, you know, some of the stories that you can tell, uh, the fact that you can lead by example. Uh, I think that's invaluable. Somebody for them to look up to. Well, to a certain extent. Although nowadays, of course, you get somebody who's in their twenties. Uh, that's now the old guy in the team, and you know, you've achieved something over a, a number of years, perhaps. But it, not like someone like myself, who'd obviously been around for a long period of time. I mean, I played for England for 20 years, started in 88, finished in, you know, obviously 2008. Um, and at that stage, the England captaincy was very much diminished. It wasn't really a selectorial uh, position. It was just a, a nominal head who would make a few uh, uh, speeches and things like that. Uh, yes, he might have picked what order the team was going to be um, playing in. But um, so there wasn't really anything for me to hang around for. I, I wasn't going to be involved with selection or anything like that. Basically, when I finished playing, that was it. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't going to get to play uh, Walker Cup again. I hadn't played since 2005. Um, which, again, was disappointing. I felt as though I could still have continued to play. Uh, I was certainly good enough. But, you see, the, the fact was I was older than the captain. I'd had a lot more experience than the captain. I mean, Peter McAvoy was one of my best-ever captains. Garth and Jimsy was another one. Um, they accepted me for, for the value that I had. But after that, there weren't those sorts of players who were um, not going to be intimidated by the fact that you know, A, I was older, B, more experienced than, and everything else. So they felt that I was going to undermine their captaincy, which is stupid. At the end of the day, I want to win that match as much as anyone. And I want to help my team win that match as much as anyone. So with the fact that I was then not going to be selected anymore uh, and couldn't be captain because of various things, but it really wasn't going to be a fact of me being a captain... Uh, that I thought, well, what am I going to do? And my, and my coach at the time, a guy called Simon Fletcher, said, um, you know, you, you've got to turn pro. And I hadn't honestly, honestly considered it until he said, you've got to turn pro. You'd be mad not to. 48 going on 49. It was just about the right time for 50 years old. I would have had to have waited until I was, um, you know, 55 before I could have played seniors golf, um, you know, uh, as an amateur. And I just thought, well, actually, yes, it sort of makes sense. And so everything then became, I, I, I had a go at tour school in 2008, missed the cut by a shot. Um, and so then it was a learning process of, well, how do you play professional golf? What tournaments are there? Yeah, you know, I, I finished up having a go at Euro Pro. Um, Which you won? Well, you in the end, that one. Uh, but in 2009, I hadn't been told that I needed to play a minimum of nine events to, for my uh, ranking to, uh, to um, go over to the following year. I only played eight, but they didn't tell me I had to play nine. So I didn't play nine. And, so, and I had no money. Uh, I was struggling for cash. Um, and so subsequently, it was always a bit of a struggle. But... Um, so I lost my ranking that I built up having played eight. So I then had to go back to the tour school in 2010. Fortunately, got my card again and then won a tournament at Stoke by Nayland. Um, shot 15 under for three rounds. Against the young kids. Against coming the through. young kids. Did you like that? Uh, well, I played really well. I shot 62 in the second round. Um, and in the end, uh, I think I finished up winning by sort of four or five shots. But it was... Um, it was a big fill-up, ten grand. Right. You know that yeah, was the other big was, thing, yeah. and uh, it allowed me to fund my golf. Um, and I can remember I got a management company, Champions UK, and uh, they got me a bit of sponsorship, which was great. 
um, with Farm Foods. Um, that brought me in a bit more money. And my, I remember I was told I was only allowed one invite, uh, which actually wasn't true, but that's what I was told. And I got an invite, uh, which was the first tournament after I got to 50. Um, so I was, because I'm an August child. This is a senior tour. Yeah, it was uh, on the, uh, the European seniors tour, as it was known then. And uh, uh, because I was a, a late 50-year-old, I wasn't going to get many opportunities. So basically, I was told, one invite, and then you'll have to go to tour school. So you needed to grab this invite then, didn't you? Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, as I say, I went to Woburn. Um, got an invite from the Duke, which was fantastic. And um, I love Woburn. It's a beautiful, beautiful yeah, golf course. Yeah. Oh, it's just one of the great clubs, actually, because uh, they've got three courses there now. And uh, anyway, we played on the Dukes. And uh, I remember I arrived early, got plenty of practice, which was great. I was playing well because I'd obviously won at Stoke Barn Ayland. And... Uh, I remember I finished tied third. So again, good money. Did that get you into the following week? Well, yeah, it was the next tournament. So in those days, it was top 10. Now it's top five. But in those days, it was top 10. So there was a lot of pressure on me in that final round when I was looking at the leaderboard. I actually had almost a sneaky chance, perhaps, of, of getting into contention. But uh, I finished tied third. So again, good money. And it got me into the next event, which was the uh, in the Czech Republic. I'm glad you said that because I can't pronounce uh, Kotnohore. Kotnohore <laughs> is, is where we, we stayed. But uh, yes. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, I turned up. I was interviewed because obviously I'd had a good result the, the, the previous tournament. It was two weeks later. And um, I... I said, oh, I don't think the course suits me. It's quite long and, uh, you know, it's it's quite a hard course. But it was very, it was tight. It was a little bit like uh, Truna Bean. So the fairways, you know, were running reasonably well. But if you missed the fairway, you could lose a ball. It was like reload. And uh, we we turned up and it's it was a court, private course for two players and a couple of other people. There was virtually no divots on any fairway. I mean, it's it's maybe two hundred rounds in the entire year. I mean, so it's a match pristine, yeah. oh, pristine, and the greens were fantastic, um, and uh, I didn't think I had a chance, but I I shot three rounds in the sixties and a couple of sixty sixes, I think. You had a sixty six, a sixty seven, and a sixty seven. All right, well there you go. And uh, I, I had to play uh, pretty much head to head against Gordon Brown Jr., who was a great player, somebody obviously we knew a lot about. And uh, I played great, I, I really did, uh, to the extent where uh, I, I, I did enough. I think he made a two on 17 to get within a couple, but 18 was par five, and I hit two really good uh, shots down there. And I think Gordon realized that. There was nothing he could do. He could have had a gone for the. He could have gone for the green, but he was thinking about yeah Just the second prize. prize. Yeah, uh, and that was a big money. I mean, first prize was ninety thousand euros. Second prize, I think, was sixty thousand. But sixty thousand was more than a lot of the guys were winning for first prize. Yeah. Uh, so he was thinking about second prize, and he he sort of basically then laid up and then played his shot on. I played a great pitch into the green, and I. I the, the video may or may not show it, but I was actually grinning when I was hitting the putt. And I didn't hole it, but it didn't matter. I still won by, as I say, two or three shots. Uh, but, I, but I was actually smiling to myself instead of focusing. Um, so Smiling because of the money? Oh, everything. I mean, because, you know, obviously it, it, it then... Because uh, I got a, a two-year exemption for winning... And that guaranteed me then, whereas now you only get a one-year exemption. Um, so, you know, there was so much about that whole week. And I can remember, um, you know, I didn't do the well the next week uh, that was, I think it was played in Sicily or somewhere like that. Not many people who win do well the following week. No. Uh, to me, <coughs> I don't understand why somebody wouldn't want to play because you're still on a roll, but it wasn't the following week. It was, again, two or three weeks later. And I think that... I'm a great believer in biorhythms. Um, not many people know much about biorhythms, but I'm a great believer in 
the value of being able to interpret uh, your biorhythms into how you're going to do. So you need to capitalize on that. I don't see, I have actually won uh, the amateur championship, uh, Royal Troon. I then went home and then drove back up to Turnbury and won the Scottish stroke play. So I'm, I, it doesn't make any difference to me. If I win, I then go out and I play the next tournament, exactly the same attitude with the same idea. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt me. I, I, I don't want, I'm not a celebrator. I don't think I've ever, ever celebrated a win. So you're saying that, though, you're saying there, like, say if you're an amateur and you went out and won again next week. Yeah. But now you're a professional and you've got a good chunk of money you've just won. Do you think that takes a little bit of hunger away for the next tournament? No, not not for me personally. I, I'm sure it does for other people. Mm. I mean, I can remember years ago, we won the Walker Cup, obviously, at, at uh, Porth Call. And then uh, the home internationals was, I think, at Hoylake. And the Scots that played in the Walker Cup didn't really want to play in the home internationals. They, they weren't hungry. I wanted to play every match. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand why. I just, I, well, I'm a, uh, an obsessive compulsive, so subsequently I wanted to play every game. I want to play every week if I could. Do you still want to hit balls now every day? <clears throat> I wish I could. I can't. My body won't allow me to do but it. But would you if you could? Oh, if I had good weather and, and good facilities and everything else, uh, I'd, I'd want to be practicing every day. I'd just, I'd just love it. But my body won't really let me hit balls anymore. I mean, even putting now, if I putt for half an hour, um, my back starts to get sore. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I know Domini takes over. I mean, I'm 60, well, yeah, I'm, I'm 62 and, you know, you, you start to feel it. I can remember years ago, um, one of the England bowlers saying I had a getting up pill because that was his painkiller because his body ached so badly that, um, you know, he just needed something. And I, I absolutely um, you know, understand that. As a young man, I played field hockey up until I was 23. Um, and then I gave it up because I realised that I was potentially going to get injured um, and that would stop me playing golf. And then from then on, um, you know, I've just, I, I was hitting 800 balls and maybe at nine holes or even 18 holes. Uh, and I was doing that virtually on a daily basis. Uh, it, it, it's wear and tear. Yeah, it takes it on all. But two more wins on the European Seniors Tour, winning Australia. Yeah. But like you just said now, you're in your 60s, still on the Seniors Tour. Mm. Is there one last win in you? I think. Um, the standard now is incredibly high. We've got some wonderful young guys. Uh, there's Adelson de Silva, who's a Brazilian, uh, wonderful golfer. Um, you know, we've got Simon Khan and, and um, you know, a whole bunch of other... Written, well, um, you've got probably 20 guys. Well, the word Legends Tour, what it's called now, is about right, isn't it? I, I honestly believe that we've got about 20 or 30 guys who are... Very capable of winning. Hit the ball long way, good players, have the ability. Um, but give me the right course uh, at the right time of year. I've already had a couple of opportunities to maybe get right into the mix. Not quite done it. But my view is that you are presented with opportunities. And eventually, if you keep doing that um, and knocking on the door, then eventually the door will open again. Well, I've seen myself today. You've got <laughs> someone in there. He's got it, hasn't he? Well, but, but I feel as though I have got it still there. It, it's not going to be easy. It's about an opportunity. I've lost in a playoff um, for the Jersey Open as well. Uh, so th there are definitely uh, opportunities out there for me. I really believe that. It's just... I'm not going to get as many, but when I do, I hopefully I'll... I'll, I'll yeah, fall back on those good uh, good memories and, and take advantage of them. I would say, Gary, you'd have to step your game up a wee bit today because I felt I had to carry it times <laughs> today. And uh, no money kidding. I thought, listen, I mean, obviously your standards are high and you keep them as high as you possibly can. Yeah. And for that reason alone, you're going to be in the mix still for a good few years yet. Well, I hope so. I mean, obviously, uh, I've been told that once you get to 60, you hit a brick wall. That's probably true. Uh, physically, uh, I've noticed that there's you know, a few more aches and pains, but I've dealt with that for probably 
10 years more. Uh, I've had bad backs since I was 16, so I manage it. Um, I've got good people, physios and osteopaths that I see. Um, but at the end of the day, it's understanding how your body works. So sometimes I might not even go out and hit balls at all before I play because I recognise that if I did, I would be struggling. I mean, last year um, at the JCB Club, which is a, a wonderful golf course, but I honestly came on the first tee for all three days, not knowing whether I was going to be able to compete uh, complete the round. So, um, you know, that's always a risk, but uh, you manage it as best you can and you, you munch your, your painkillers and hopefully it gets you through. Um, I mean... You know, it, it's it, it's just one of those things. I accept it and get on with it, and, and I manage it as best I can. Well, obviously, you know your body better than anybody else, mm -hmm. and you know what you can actually achieve and, you know, how far you can go each time. Yeah. And like you said, when it's in your head, you know when you've got to practice, know yeah. when you've got to pull back a little you bit. You manage yourself as best you can. You manage you can. it as best you can. Um, but uh, I, certainly <clears throat> my game is, I think the modern equipment's helping me a little bit. Uh, I'm never going to be long enough uh, to hit par fives in two very often, but uh, you have other attributes. Uh, unfortunately, I've got a better short game than most of the guys out there, which allows me to compete. And especially if we get a roll of events, you know, you go one week to the next week to the next week, and you actually then improve things as you're going along. Uh, but I can't emphasize enough, whether you're young or old, you cannot practice your short game enough. It is the one reason that you will either lower your handicap or win tournaments, because... You, you see guys who hit it miles, knock it on the greens, can't hold a putt to save their life. And without the putter, putter is the most important thing, but next is the lob wedge. You, you've got to work those clubs all the time um, to the extent where you can turn an average round into a good round. And that's what allows you to be competitive. And fortunately, I've had some great coaches and I do understand. I mean, we talked about Ola Tharbel and, and Seve giving me coaching. I've learned a lot from watching other people. My father was a good coach. Um, you know, I didn't get the opportunity to utilize that very much because uh, he died when he was very young. Um, and I wish in some respects he was still around to be able to see me now. Um, I'd like to think that he'd be quite proud of what I've achieved, considering the warnings that he gave me, um, you know, that he'd struggled. Um, but I suppose the seniors golf is a little bit easier because uh, getting there is the hard part. There's a lot of guys that come on to the seniors uh, who've maybe had a five-year break and they can't get, it, get back. it back. No. Yeah, keep it's, playing. It's, you've got to keep playing. Right, we're coming to the end. We always do a great Rapid 15. John's got some questions for you. All right, gosh. Rapid no, 15. No pressure, Gary. Though. There's No, there's no pressure, but uh, they're, they're quite simple, really. I mean, they're no, uh, no great shakes. So... Let me start you with Rory McIlroy or Tiger Woods. God, it's going to be quick fire. You'd have to say Woods, but I love watching McIlroy play. It just drives Don't me nuts. Don't sit on the fence. It's yeah. on the fence, yeah. right? On the fence. It's come come just, John. McIlroy drives me nuts. Woods was always one of those guys that seemed to just pull it out the right time. The Open or the Masters? Oh, Masters. Tea or coffee? I tend to drink coffee more, so coffee. Favourite football team? I'm an Evertonian for my sins. Oh, tough times. Yeah. St Andrews or Augusta? Oh, Augusta by a mile. Favourite golfing holiday destination? Portugal. Favourite golf course played? Well, you'd, you'd have to say Augusta, but actually, uh, I think Muirfield Village actually is, is one of the great courses to play. Favourite all-time golfer? Do you know, it's funny, uh, that's that's a really hard one because uh, there's been some so many great, uh, um, great players. I suppose Nicholas always was my favourite. Best tournament played in? Augusta by a mile. Ronaldo or Messi? Do you know, uh, I love Ronaldo. I just personally, I think what he can do is, and he's kept himself fit, I appreciate Messi and what he can do, and maybe he's a little less uh, temperamental, but I love that showman. Lynx or Parkland Golf? Some quick Probably, fire 15. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, 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 Parkland, yeah. 
Favourite club manufacturer? Oh, Again, that's, that's, a, in that. That, that's yeah. another really hard one. I was a ping player for 25 years. Then I turned professional and they didn't want to know. Then they wanted to know and then they didn't want to know. So uh, I, I, I suppose ping, probably, but that's more historical. How many holes in one? I've had 24 now. Pardon? Oh. How many? 24. Oh. My father had 22 as a professional, but I've had 24 throughout my career and only one of them has actually made me any money. <laughs> PGA or live golf? You have to qualify it, unfortunately. The reason why I'm going to say I like the idea of live is because it shook the game up, which needed shaking up. Uh, but the PGA Tour is wonderful. But personally, I think that uh, the uh, DP World Tour is the one because you go to such a variety of countries and places. Ryder Cup or the Open? Open. That concludes. Gary, you've been a star. Thank you very much, and good luck in your rest of yes, your career. Thank you. I Gary, really you've been absolutely that. magnificent today. Great to watch, great to play with, great company. Thank you very much well, indeed. It's been my pleasure. I've, I've really enjoyed it. I hope we, hopefully we'll get the chance to do it again sometime. Thank you.